Welcome to Co-Design in Action, uh, where we're going to be talking about the dynamic infrastructure services layer. Um, our speakers today are Amit Sanala, who is a research scientist with Red Hat, and Jason Schlechman, who's a principal software engineer with Red Hat, and Ben Cushing, who's uh, one of our chief architects in the health and life sciences at Red Hat will be leading the conversation. So um, feel free to ask questions in the chat or if you wanna share your audio and video and ask questions, that's fine too. This is meant to be a conversation. So um, there will be pauses and people will uh, ask you to join in if you have comments or questions. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Ahmed. Thanks. Morning all. Well, actually I'm gonna hand it over to Ben. <laughs> Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, first off, let, before we get started, I just, um, I want to make sure for the folks that are listening in, uh, can everyone just give us a quick, like, thumbs up or a, a yes to, can you all hear us okay, and can you see us okay, and all that goodness. Hey, hey Tony. All right, fantastic. So it looks like we're, we're online properly. Uh, all right, so um, second to that, uh, I think for today, just to double down on what Heidi just said, the, the ideal state for, for us on the, the presentation is that the, you guys are asking us questions, like actively asking questions. Um, so for instance, you know, we're gonna go through the value proposition of, of uh, the DISL and you know, you might not understand what we're talking about, or we might have missed an entire potential avenue of value with this this uh, capability. Uh, and those those are the kind of things we would like to hear from you about. So please do share that content and thoughts uh, actively. Um, honestly, I I think we're failing if the uh, uh, if we're uh, just talking at you for the duration of this this presentation. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and um, pull up just the first couple slides here uh, before uh, turning it over to Ahmed uh, and just to get rolling. Oh, you did it. Great. There we go. OK, so um, all right, so first off, uh, we're going to cover just the, the general value uh, of the work going on here, why it's important for the community. Um, we're going to talk at length about the uh, the actual like hardware state that exists for edge computing and how configurable software is is likely to change that paradigm. Um, the uh, just moving a little bit faster through the overview here, the uh, primer on F uh, FPGAs is in order just because I'm assuming not everybody knows what those are and how. Uh, how they're useful. Um, we al we also have a whole bunch of demos at the uh, uh, probably the mid to tail of this, so stick around for that kind of content. Um, and uh, and then uh, ultimately, we also have a uh, a, a uh, customer online um, uh, who's interested, who's actually engaged in in using this type of approach. Um, so that's the company Three EO. So uh, we'll probably give them some time as well uh, to speak about how this impacts their business and how you know this directly applies to their use cases and requirements. All right. So um, Ahmed, why don't you start here, and uh, I'll I'll pause talking for a moment, and I'll I'll pepper you with questions as we move along. Sounds good. I'll I'll mind if I share my screen. Oh yeah, go ahead. All right, um, so morning again all, um, or afternoon or evening, where are you joining us from? So um, let's start with the most fundamental motivations there, and that's, you know, the value of co-design. And um, if you look at, you know, your typical approach to optimization, you start with an op unoptimized workload, which is an application that's running on a general purpose software stack, which is running on a general purpose hardware stack. And that's 
because everything is so general purpose, it's easy to get something up and running, very efficient development cycle there. Um, but when we start to optimize things, traditionally we would um, optimize <clears throat> the application by maybe rewriting the source code, uh, maybe linking in some more efficient libraries. Um, we can also try to optimize the software stack, um, try to optimize the kernel in some way to make our application, our workload run more efficiently. We have done we have ongoing projects looking at that, such as the Unikernel Linux project. We've got projects that are looking at trying to do this with the EVPF packet filtering. We've also got projects that are looking at optimizing the um, the configuration of the NIC so that our networking flow is a lot more efficient. Um, but one of the things that usually is a, an incredible source of performance that it gets left on the table is the hardware stack. And that's because hardware stack typically tends to be quite rigid, quite difficult to modify. But imagine that wasn't the case. Imagine you don't just have an optimized application, but you also have an optimized software stack and that's running on an optimized hardware stack that's tailor-made for your application to run as efficiently as possible. Just imagine the value of something like that. Um, it, it can be a bit complex, though, to do that. But just try to imagine that what if it wasn't? What if you could as easily as you're able to change software and then write, you know, optimize your applications and software, you're able to also optimize hardware, just the immense value in being able to do something like that. Um, and then do that with open source uh, because hardware is no different to software when it comes to the benefits of open source. I mean, everything you, I'll get rid of the blinking mouse, sorry. Um, just like you see, you know, benefits in software with open source, you're gonna see the same value in hardware. And there's one thing here that I really wanna emphasize on and that's lock-ins. And in one sense, it's your traditional lock-ins that you're avoiding by having open source, by having the choice for your infrastructure, for your stacks. But there's also this case of, uh, of hardware doing something that we call lock-in back propagation, where you may have a hardware that's way out in the far edge, uh, but if that's proprietary or that's built using proprietary stuff, that that will lock you in and that could potentially lock you in to a stack that goes from the edge all the way up to the cloud. So even though you may not be you know, locked in per se in the cloud, but by, by that by using that as device, you're locking, you're potentially getting locked in all the way up. Uh, and that's a real, you know, challenge concern when working with, you know, proprietary hardware. And that's where open source hardware tooling can really help you with that flexibility. Um, and so this year we started this uh, co-design lab as part of the Red Hat Boston University Collaboratory. So this is an on-premise lab uh that is aimed at providing the infrastructure and engineering foundation needed to support co-design research um the basic idea was that there's a lot of potential to far edge research with these hardware devices there's a lot of benefits there there's a lot of opportunity there but if all that stuff is locked in some cabinet in some remote data center or some shared infrastructure it's very hard to really innovate to do these aggressive experiments to really test the boundaries of what we're able to achieve when we have control over the hardware, where we're able to have this really optimized software and hardware stack working together, you know, the core value of co-design. And so that's why we started the Codes Lab. The idea being, let's bring it from that shared infrastructure to our, you know, tabletops, to our desktops, to our on-premise labs, to really try out these you know, system optimizations, these custom system stacks to incubate this innovation. And then we get it to a point where it's stable enough, then then we can shift it out, then we can deploy it at scale, and then we can, you know, even continue innovating once it's out there. Um, and so out of the code is that we're doing a lot of projects that range from tooling to hardware to, to you know, applications and one of the core specialized hardware, because Codes Lab is, is, is covering a bunch of hardware from ASICs to FPGAs to microcontrollers. Um, but one of the specialized hardware that, that, is, that we're gonna focus on today is FPGAs and field programmable gate arrays. If you think of the line from 
programmability to performance where microcontrollers give you a lot of programmability at the edge um, because you know they're easy to program uh, like tiny CPUs way out there. Um, or on the other end of the spectrum with performance, you have ASICs, which is hardware down to the gate that you have designed specifically to get your work done efficiently. You get a whole bunch of performance, energy efficiency out of it. The FPGAs lie somewhere in the middle. And that's the big value proposition for FPGAs because versus microcontrollers, because you're able to change hardware, you have greater flexibility in how you deploy your applications. You have more connectivity options. It's not that you know this microcontroller gave me two SPI uh, connections and that's all I'm limited to. With, with FPGAs, you can interface most serial protocols under the sun. It's, it's really, you know, flexible in how you able to deploy applications. And, you know, because it's custom hardware, you get higher energy efficiency, you get better performance, and it's, it's very hard to lock you into a software stack if you can just change the hardware. Um, and then with FPGAs, you don't have to compete with the existing, you know, tools out there like free RTOS because um, over there, there's a lot of, you know, effort and investment that's gone in there. And so if you're trying to get your stuff working, uh, try to get your tools out, it, it becomes a challenge trying to compete there. But with FPGAs, it's 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 a lot more opportunity there. Um, versus ASICs, it's because FPGAs are off the shelf, it's a faster time to market. Uh, you just go out, buy an FPGA. Um, it, you have to wait for Amazon to deliver it or whatever vendor you're buying it from, but, you know, still faster time than one to three years that it takes to make an ASIC. Um, there's a lower risk of over specialization. I was uh, listening to a talk um, last year at Supercomputing, and someone mentioned that there are startups who invested in a CNN chip, and by the time their chips are going to get to production, uh, the, the nature of CNN has changed. When they made their chips, their CNNs were low memory usage, and so they designed their chips with smaller on-chip memories. But now, convolution neural nets need a lot more memory. And so those chips are not going to be able to compete with how CNNs are done today. Uh, so there's a risk of over-specialization when you commit to a hardware and knowing that I will have access to this one to three years down the road, not you know sooner than that. There's also a layer of abstraction, right? So the you want the chip evolution and the device evolution to be independent of the logic that's going to evolve as well. And those two things, when they're coupled together, you've added a layer of complexity um, that's, you, you've added a single life cycle, which of a more complex system, which means it'll evolve slower, right? And by decoupling the hardware from the, the logic itself, um, the logic can, of course, have its own life cycle. The hardware can have its own life cycle. And because of that lower complexity and, simpli and the added simplicity, um, the speed of an acceleration of innovation is just increased. And um, I think, so let me give an example. Uh, we actually, uh, at one point, uh, when I was, I was working with the Department of, Eng of uh, Energy, you know, they have sensors that are sitting around a uh, tokamak, which is the, you know, sort of torus shaped fusion reaction or fusion uh, reactor. And they have uh, thousands of these tiny little sensors. And, and the sensor's job uh, is, to, uh, is to understand the pressure and ultimately heat being produced by the plasma inside of the arc reactor and and then adjust in very very short amount of time like subsecond times adjust the magnetic fields that contain that plasma and one of the first things that this research team asked was how um well they said for up front like we're we're using fpgas but we don't really at the moment have a way to decouple the FPGA logic from the actual hardware. So we find ourselves, because they're innovating like at a breathtaking pace, right? They're buying new hardware every year for these sensors. Um, they don't have a way, they didn't have a way to decouple uh, 
those two concerns and they were sort of st stuck with um you know the the pace in which the fpga provider was updating their own software they were very curious on you know how can we how can we get podman on these for instance like because and i was like well why do you want podman there and it was sort of the same rationale that Ahmed's giving right now, which is we want to bring new uh, ideas to the, the to the hardware, and we need to do it at a at a really quick pace to keep to keep up with the level of innovations that's expected of us, right? They're in a race to sort of like save the world, right? Really, with like energy d demand and everything else that's driving a lot of. Uh, you know, both cultural and, and financial problems and, and climate problems all over the world. So like for them, the, the, the need to move forward quickly is very, very palpable. And the pressure, the downward pressure on them is very, very high. Um, uh, and there's also a race to, to uh, dominance, right? Like there's a number of nations that are really trying to get fusion done quickly. So they're, you know, it's, it's a healthy competition in my, my opinion. So, so anyways, that, 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 for me is like the first part of and, and a place where you might see this kind of desire and and uh and need uh are there any other examples out there that are maybe less extreme than what i just gave uh from the audience uh please pepper the comment section uh if you have any of them because we'd be really interested to learn um if you've if you've stumbled across any of these types of use cases all right, go go back, Ahmed. I'm going uh, to quiet down for a second. No, that was great. Um, so the last slide, then we can pause for the questions or discussion. Um, just to round off the motivation. Um, and one of the challenges with FPGAs has you know, to have been pretty difficult to use. I mean, compared to, especially if you compare it to a microcontroller, where it's basically a very familiar language that you're working with, very familiar semantics and syntax. Um, with FPGAs, it becomes quite complex. And, one of the major reasons for that is it's not traditional in how we develop stuff for an FPGA because here we have this unique challenge where you have two development cycles that are going to come together to make your design. You're going to have the uh, software development cycle with its own complexities and overheads and expertise and requirements. And then you have the hardware development cycle with its own challenges and its own hardware. And there's usually a very longer overhead um and its own expertise and um you know approaches and so when that has to come together if it's not done right it can be very inefficient so traditionally <clears throat> the way that this does happen today is it's usually you know the hardware development that gets extended out uh through tooling through interfaces to some form of software stack that then eventually exposes apis to the software developer the problem with that is that then it's very constrained because the hardware developer is trying to has to build something that's general purpose that will work for a wide you know, pool of applications. Uh, but if you try to do it the other way around, then it's sorry, <clears throat> the software developer who has to then learn HDL, learn has to learn, you know, even if they're just changing, sorry. <clears throat> they just have to change, uh, even if they're just changing parameters in HDL, that's also pretty complex because when you change a parameter, there could be you know tens or hundreds of things that that parameter is going to go in and modify, and that could break things very easily. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of complexities there as well. So uh, thus far, there hasn't been an easy way to have these two development cycles come together, coexist while co-designing. Um, but you know, that's what this is for. So I, I can pause there for any questions. If anyone has, yeah, I don't see any questions. Um, but uh, uh, both Bruce and Sanjay are sharing uh, some specific scientific application similar to what I had uh, brought up with with uh, uh, DOE. And I, I should be specific. It wasn't. It was um, uh, Stanford National Labs is the place where where this these questions were coming from. Um, probably worth a follow up with them. Actually, Ahmed, <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, maybe a post post call today. Um, yes, yeah, Slack. Thank you, Bruce. So, um, the, uh, and Sanjay, thank you for sharing that paper. Uh, I just pulled it up. It looks like some pretty thick, uh, content that, uh, we'll have to probably go through offline. Um, 
uh, just uh, I don't know if I can read that on, on the fly, but uh, yeah, and, and then Hugh made a made a good point about you know the, just the general um, applicability of this for low power uh, devices um, that are either simulating AI like cognition or actually just running straight up uh, 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 models of, of, of any type, uh, whether you know, some sort of LLM or, or machine learning model or anything like that. So, um, so why don't we get into what is the DISL? I, obviously it's, well, it is the dynamic infrastructure services layer. Um, I think everyone here should probably be asking themselves, what does that mean? Uh, thankfully, Ahmed and Jason are prepared to tell us. Um, but I mean, the, the short answer of course, is this is a way to abstract uh, away all of that that uh, custom hardware, custom software uh, development, and really move this into an open source uh, software uh, control. So, like, think about the um, infrastructure as code uh, movement that's happening inside of the networking world. Same idea here, but it's just at a very very small uh, small device stage. So, all right, go ahead, Amen, please. So. Um... Like Ben said, DISL, if it was a one line answer, what is DISL? DISL is an abstraction layer. Um, the long answer is that it's an abstraction layer that allows these two cycles to exist and to work efficiently in their own you know, um, processes. And so what DISL can be thought of as the three parts. First part is the interface it exposes to the software developer. And it's basically a configuration file and the, the idea behind this is you can build your software stacks, your application stacks, however it works well for your workload, whether that's you know, writing a DSL or some domain specific abstractions, or maybe even using generative AI. But all that has to eventually boil down to or get parsed down to or compiled down to this configuration file. And if you can do that, then without having to touch HDL, you'll have a system that's been customized to your to make your application run efficiently um, on the hardware side we have an interface there as well and the idea behind that is it gives hardware developers a mechanism of packaging their hardware ip blocks so that they're more conducive to modifications and customizations by the software developer and the third part is the system builder which takes in these configurations uh, and from that generates the ready to compile hardware files, so like Verilog files and parameters, as well as any supporting software like compilation scripts or if you have any soft cores, so supporting files for that. So looking at these three parts in a bit more detail, um, for the software interface, th the system configuration file um, is not just you know, a collection of random variables and their associated values. What we've tried to do here is to encapsulate the hardware design process as if you know as a hardware developer if i'm writing out a verilog file and trying to create this arbitrary system what are the process that i will go through and then you know translate that process into hdl code except here it's that process minus the actual hdl code and what we're hoping to get from this is that this will work not just for you know a very small subset of workloads but rather for a majority of applications that you're trying to deploy in hardware, whether that is, you know, you're using this to build out a full adder from AND gates, or you're trying to build out an MPSOC from, from individual system and chip definitions. You're, it, allow, it aims to give you that flexibility so you can design small to large systems, to design SOCs, to design, you know, rec, arbitrary pipelines, whatever needs to happen for your application to run efficiently. On the hardware side, the interface there aims to take your traditional board-specific IP blocks, which has very tightly integrated HDL code, um, and split that up into different parts. One part will continue to be rigid and inflexible because that's board-specific, because that has to target FIs or ASICs within the FPGA. Um, but then there's going to be a piece that you can actually customize. And we're going to see uh, some examples of this in the next few slides that when you're able to customize that HDL from that IP, 
you're able to get a lot more value out of it. And this doesn't have to be, you know, I just increased my SIMD size in my, you know, um, multiply add unit um, or multiply accumulate unit. This could be something as complex as I am configuring my PCI stack, my network stack, my TDR controller stack for that, for that to be more application specific. And then finally, we also have the HDL parameters, which get mapped into more um, trivial representations of what that parameter will do. Because like I mentioned earlier, if you modify HDL parameters, typically the effect is quite widespread, not just, hey, I just increase the size of this, right? It can have an impact throughout your design and potentially break it. Uh, but what this allows to happen is to map those complex impacts into something that's more obvious. And so when you modify these parameters that have been abstracted, it's very clear how the hardware will change. And you know, if you're packaging things this way, then it becomes also easy to support multiple boards so that you don't have to you know, redo your entire design. You just have to uh, you know, make sure that your board specific HDL matches the template that interfaces the generic HDL and you're good to go. So some examples of how we have active projects that are looking into this and are trying to demonstrate the value here. We have a project that's trying to take the traditional PCI system and add to it support for Word IO so that when you plug your FPGA card into the PCI slot with this on it, you don't need any custom drivers or any downstream drivers that you modified to get your design working. You can leverage the Word IO drivers already in there in the kernel. We also have a project that's trying to build a custom Ethernet subsystem where we're trying to move workloads inside the network stack. So things like trying to build a custom architecture for eBPF packet filtering. So there's not just not even a CPU inside the network stack, but a architecture that specifically does eBPF packet filtering and then have multiple of these. So you're processing packets at line rate and now you're starting to make things look more practical, such as zero trust networking. And then we have uh, an existing implementation of the DDR3 subs uh, subsystem, which we have made customizable. We are able to do things like do application specific addressing. And then we have a project that's also trying to move this onto the DDR4 uh, technology as well. And then the third part of this will is the system builder. And what this does is this takes in that saw system configuration that came from the application side, takes the IP configuration and competent library that came from the hardware side, add in some context of definition, and then from that, you know, does its thing and it generates the system again ready to compile and any supporting software that could be needed. So I think that's another great pause point before we get into the demo itself. All right, yeah. So on this pause, um, again, audience, uh, uh, love in the chat right now. Any any additional questions, thoughts? Um, uh, no one expects everyone here to understand all of this right up front, right? This is a this is a very nascent capability here that's being developed. Generally, if you're curious about this, this that's what we're looking for, right? We want to build a community. Uh, around this and curiosity is is how we get started with building that community um so uh you're you're amongst a, a lot of people including myself who are coming into this pretty fresh and, and may not understand all the particular details um it's thankfully abstracting a lot of this for us and like you know using uh diagrams that are a little bit um uh probably not entirely accurate to how it all functions but are easier to to grasp um i think part of the the development that might happen in the community is uh adding more layers of abstraction even so to simplify this further and further and further uh with hopefully some end state where the sort of like the citizen developer can come in write logic and not worry about any anything that's going on <laughs> um uh, but anyway that's that's the uh, the ideal state uh so so uh, keep your questions coming, keep your comments uh, flowing, please. And uh, let's move into the demos just to give you guys a sense of what this looks like. And my commitment to y'all is 
you're going to go through this uh, for the next hour. And we're going to get to F FPGA development, and we're going to write stuff to run on the FPGA. We're not going to see any HDL. Um, and, if, and that's really trying to highlight the value that this is going to bring. Actually, you know what, um, I mean, why, don't, why don't we do a sec real quick on this, this break here. Why don't we ask um, Jeremy from 3EO to talk about his act, what he's actually built and, and maybe we talk a little bit around how that relates to the DISL uh, itself. And then that way, when we get into these demos, we can relate it back to what 3EO is doing with their devices. Sure, so you guys, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we sure can. Welcome, and, Jeremy. And, yeah, and can you see me? I'm just, uh, just just curious. Yeah, we can see you. Yeah, so so uh, guys, pleasure to say hello to everybody. My name is Jeremy Schubert. I'm the CEO of 3EO Health. Um, uh, so to give you a little bit of background of kind of what we are, uh, we're a point of care molecular uh, diagnostic company. As you guys will probably experience through the COVID pandemic, you see uh, a number of kind of COVID tests that have now changed the way people kind of look at managing their care, where testing shifted away from being in the health system and, and into the home where people were kind of self-testing. Now, this isn't a conversation about COVID, but that's a use case for helping everybody understand maybe in this sector of healthcare, how things are likely to change and how healthcare actually gets solved. So just a little bit of background on me. I'm a public health guy by training, so I'm a, I'm a MPH. Uh, so, so what I'm going to talk to you about is effectively how healthcare gets solved. And then we'll talk through a you know, use case of our device, which I think then we'll bend into kind of how, um, how what, 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 what our man Ben have been talking about could, could get applied. So one of the challenges with healthcare, uh, and it's a great statement that, that, that gets used, is uh, healthcare was uh, designed to, to do the hard, but spends its time doing the easy and then making the easy look hard. All right. That's what kind of effectively our health system does. Uh, and, and it's largely because we force all of the, the health issues kind of into a health system or a hospital to be managed. And that's the most ineffective place for those things to be managed. So if you want to think about it against that quote, it's about how do we move things away from the health system, not into them, right? So how do we put them in the place where it's more appropriately for them to get managed? And we kind of saw that with testing moving into the home with COVID. And so what you're likely to see or what should happen uh, to make healthcare more affordable and more accessible and, and, and more equitable across the globe is for the actual walls of the health system to come down. So for the health system, depending on how you want to define it, it, that it extends the four walls into the community and into the home, right? So that's effectively, we want to think about a health system as virtual, not as bricks and mortars, not as physicians, but as this virtual system that kind of surrounds us like Wi-Fi. Now, uh, one of the central elements to enable that to happen is, is actually the data that happens in somebody's normal day-to-day -day life. Right. So it's, you know, when you go to the doctor and he's trying to figure out what's wrong with you, he's asking you 20 questions. He takes 60 vials of blood. He sticks things in orifice that, that you don't want to have things stuck in uh, all to find out this just as much data as they can about what might be going on. When the reality of life is if they had access and clarity and the ability to consume the data from your day to day life, there would be a whole lot more they could do for you faster. Uh, if they could get that data and interpret it in a clean and efficient way. And uh, there's a lot of things that are, that are going to shift to enable that, that to happen. Uh, now, everybody on here is going to be familiar with wearable devices and, and the technology that's happening there. Uh, but then you have some kind of interesting, weird and wonderful things like let's think about infectious disease where testing kind of comes into play. And that's what we saw with covid so what we've been doing, and so what you see, what you see, if you can see it in my hand, this is our a molecular testing device. So believe it or not, this actually tests for viruses at a molecular level. And um, if you think about it, it's small enough to be able to go anywhere. This could sit in the home. This could sit at a school. This could sit at a workplace. This could sit at a pharmacy. Uh, this could sit at a kiosk on a corner somewhere, you know, to, you know for, te for testing to be done. 
Um, and the essential thing about this, uh, you know, what, what, what's a little bit different than what we experienced with COVID is something like this device that's small and can go anywhere. Now there, we've got a technology that three O's invented that actually can do this for low cost. So it's now uh, not a, Hey, we can move a molecular test into the home. Um, and it costs eighty dollars a test to do. Now we can move it into the home, and it actually be highly affordable. Now, yeah, what that has the, to do with this kind of case? Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Oh, just your uh, your video is kind of uh, breaking up a little bit, so there was a pause there. But I, oh. I just want to add that the um, now if you start to think about this from a fleet perspective, right? That one that one device that you're holding there could be used by hospitals at home, any number of locations, really. Um, and the pace in which the uh, the cognition happens on that device is sort of stagnant in the sense that like the, the molecular test itself is capable of doing a chemical match, right? Of RNA matching yeah. of the actual uh, viruses that it's designed to detect. But there's a, a layer right above that of cognition that's missing right. and and the ability to move quickly in updating that layer of cognition is really what we're talking about here with disl which is we can start to configure the software layer to find any number of things so an example might be uh you know let's say the pcr test is determining whether you have covid but the actual variant itself is sort of unexpressed. Um, it might be a new a new uh, variant itself that's happening in the wild. Uh, so in that, like 3EO might be developing the actual uh, enzymes that are necessary to detect it, but also the software is capable of doing that a little bit up front to at least give you a sense of what that is. And researchers need to know that, right? Like the organizations that, that are responsible for, for uh, categorizing or classifying those new variants need that kind of content, uh, which, yeah. you know, a company like 3EO would be able to provide. Yeah. And then just to add on to ben, what Ben saying, and you can think about this and you know, where there's, there's just this tremendous wealth of opportunity. There's a preload opportunity. And then there's this kind of postload opportunity kind of in this, in this preload sector, when someone's doing a test, it would be really useful to know what's the incidence and prevalence of what they're testing for in the area, right? Um, you know, because symptoms might be driven. To, let's, the example we often use is if you have allergies and you have, you know, that looks like symptoms of having a flu or COVID or whatever it might be. Wouldn't it be helpful to know that, you know, before you did your test that, you know, there's that the, that the pollen count is through the roof, right? And being able to push data, understand data that would be useful to inform the person doing the testing. Mm -hmm. On the back side, as has been said, if you if you think about this as a as a, and we can look at it in a, um, yeah, I often use the Veterans Administration as a backdrop to this. But if you could look at it as a, hey, I put these devices across my health system, you know. So if I'm in, you know, I live in Northern Illinois, so in Northern Illinois, this is across households and whatnot. If I could collect all of that data that's coming through. Um, then now I've got a better understanding from a public health perspective, how I'm managing my patients, um, you know, as a physician or as a, as an organization, if I can consolidate that. But by the same token, um, if I have, again, that front end preload layer, now I haven't, I, I might have a better understanding of what might be driving the migration of, of the virus, right. You know, in, if it, in a COVID sense. And then there's this final domain, which is, I think, uh, also, um, also quite interesting is the fact that when we think about one of the problems with the the you know healthcare system in, in just you guys can can relate to it from just you know general today one of the problems when somebody when a physician prescribes a therapy or a diet for example people don't comply then all of a sudden you don't get benefit if you don't take the drug you don't get benefit if you don't comply to the instructions right well, when we think about the challenges with edge devices, people have to interface, right? And it's all great and, and wonderful if you have an, an, a, a, an Apple iWatch, but if you don't wear it, right, then it's not really, if you don't wear the wearable, it's not really going to help you. If you don't upload the data, it's not going to help you. One of the interesting things about what we see with, with, with COVID testing, again, this isn't about COVID testing. It's just an example of what happens in the testing home. Testing in general, right? 
Yeah, testing journals. People, if they do the testing in the home, well, that's an event that's not recorded anywhere unless they do take an action on it. And right now, um, and right now, if, if they're not testing and they feel bad, and there's just no record that somebody had it, right? Because there's no test, right? So there's not even an action. The 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 philosophy is, hey, if you have a you have something that's an, an edge device, so to speak, this this actually gives physicians the opportunity, you know, for you know to actually create interaction with the system from people, right? If they're doing well, testing, the pub, maybe the public health. Negative. Like just to, to to call it out, it's like the the public health impact is huge when we actually have the data right yeah exactly um, and there's, right. there's there's two parts right there's the logic that can happen at the edge that can address any number of use cases and those use cases will change over time as as you know any sort of disease state will change and then there's the the ultimate like reporting of that information and decisions getting made by uh, health agencies about how to invest or divest money into certain areas to properly address a pandemic or anything of that nature. Um, yeah. So, so Jeremy, why don't we pause there on, with 3EO? Let's go back to Ahmed. Let's start going through some of these demos uh, right now, so we can kind of under see exactly what uh, all those diagrams really meant <laughs> from like a code perspective, um, and we'll we'll readdress some of the use cases uh, uh, in in a little bit as we get the demos rolling. Thank you, Jeremy. So for the for the demo, what we're gonna do is be software developers who are gonna build a custom wireless security system using off-the-shelf components, which means we're not gonna be working with HDL. We're just gonna leverage the abstraction offered by Dissel. So some requirements. Uh, so no vendor cloud lock-in, which means we should be able to interface that um, doorbell system directly without having to send data to sort of cloud and then pulling it in through on our app or something. Um, we want to use low cost off the shelf components. We wanna use open source hardware IP and software tooling to the greatest extent possible. We want a highly flexible design that can be customized so that we're able to meet our performance or energy constraints and make trade-offs as needed. Uh, we want to wirelessly access it so that we can configure the FPGA. We can load any programs on any soft core running inside the FPGA and we want to communicate with the application to move data in and out. Um, and then we want to do this in a secure manner because right now we're demoing one device, but we could have hundreds or tens of thousands of these devices in the field. Um, what you're going to see in this demo is, like I said, to the greatest extent possible, open source tooling and IP blocks. It's not possible at this point to be completely open source because there are some parts that do need proprietary tooling, but that's because it's a limitation of the open source tools um, we're not quite there yet functionally, but we hope to be in the future, um, at least for the devices that we're targeting. And these include multiple FPGA boards, uh, multiple hardware types, where different types like microcontrollers, FPGA, and ASICs are deployed in places where they're getting the most value, whether it's microcontrollers as a communication processor, FPGA as a data processor, and ASICs as these DSPs inside the camera module. And then we've split the demo into two parts. The first part will be doing the co-design where we're going to try to build the uh, application on the FPGA. And then the second part which Jason will talk about is going to try to take all this thing wireless. So part A, generating and optimizing the hardware design. So this is our hardware setup. We've got a host CPU that's hooked up to a couple of FPGA boards, which in turn are hooked up to a camera sensor each. And then one of the boards is also hooked up to a temperature sensors. We want to demonstrate that you can interface multiple different types of sensors as well, not just the camera module. And then we got a power meter in there just so that we can show that we are being energy efficient. Um, keep in mind that these are off the shelf boards. So the, the energy values that you'll be seeing or the current values that you're seeing is both a function of what the FPGA is doing and what the board is pulling in. And it is possible to get even lower you know, current user overall energy usage if we have our custom PCB board, not an ASIC, this custom PCB board with even fewer stuff on it uh, that's more application specific. I just want to add real quick that when you talk about those 
those off the shelf boards and off the shelf hardware, there's almost an order of magnitude difference in cost between buying the stuff off the shelf and then go buying a specific FPGA hardware solution from like a, a like a company that's the markup on it is just incredible. So when you when we think about this, really don't lose track of the of the cost impacts of doing it in this way. Um, it, we're talking it, like at scale, this is millions and millions and millions of dollars. <clears throat> and so um, what we've done is we've built this web UI, you know, uh, we're not UI UX folks, so it's going to be a bit clunky. Uh, but we'll just try to highlight that this is something you're able to do because you have this. So you're able to create these abstractions so that you're not even touching the configuration file directly. You're able to abstract even that away if need be to make things even more simpler. Um, so this is the first SSC, the, the system and chip we're going to generate. We're going to have a RISC-V soft core that's hooked up to an ITC bus talking to the temperature sensor. We're going to have a GPIO module just so that I can turn the lights off so that it's using a little less energy. Um, then we have the debug port that's going to send messages to the host over UART. We have a timer module. Then we have a chip manager that's running using our custom JTAG stack that's selecting between programming uh, mode where the programmer talks to the cache and loads instructions in it and then connect it to the risk five for running the application. Um, so let's run through first part of the demo where we generate our system and deploy our first application on it. So this is the interface. Um, what we could do is we could go through, you know, the initial part of specifying manually the different fields of that system configuration file, or we could use this SOC builder utility and within a few seconds, just specifying the project name, the board, which soft core we want to use, uh, what memory map units we want to hook up to that soft core, and then any system parameters that can't be inferred. Um, we hit generate and there's that configuration file. So we can go into build and then we hit generate, this will does its thing. And we now have our hardware files ready to compile. Oh, I'm gonna move the mouse out of the way, sorry. We hit compile and then we're now translating that HDL into the bitstream that's gonna be deployed on the FPGA. So while that's happening, um, if there was something in the SOC that we wanted to customize further, we can absolutely do that. So we can go back into modules. If you want to add something additional to our SOC, we can do that. Um, if we have something that was instantiated and we want to customize it, we can load up its parameters and go in and change something there. Um, so if you are wondering, what if I had a larger cache? What if my cache was right through versus right back? You know, you could play around with those parameters to make sure that your system is operating as efficiently as possible. If you have soft cores, you can go in and change or customize the compilation flow for that on the host side. And on the device side, you can change the memory maps uh, beyond the default ones that was generated here. Uh, there could be including new modules, changing order of module, changing their addresses. Um, then we have custom signals. These are like intrinsics in software where there are certain things you can do very efficiently in hardware. But you don't really need a full module to do it. And so you can use these intrinsics to generate quickly things like bit manipulation, like latches, et cetera. And then you can generate your interconnect. You can hook things together. Um, this could be static interconnects, interconnects where two things talk to each other all the time. This could be dynamic interconnects where they talk under certain conditions. Um, and then this could also be things like memory maps that you're seeing there with a CPU memory that's talking to the cache, to the debug, I2C bus, et cetera. And then here you can also see the dynamic interconnect where the CPU and the program are talking to the cache based on the reprogram uh, value, signal value. And here you can see an illustration of the system that we just generated. And here you see that based on that reprogram signal that we have generated from the chip manager, uh, we're able to choose what's talking to the cache at any given point. And then overrides, this is a hardware specific concept that just rounds off our system development and just says that when you connect to interfaces, a whole bunch of signals get connected as well. And if you want to sort of manipulate an individual signal within that interface, this just allows it to do that, such as, you know, hardwiring something to zero or one. So we're back at the compilation flow. Um, we're at the second last step, the route design typically, you know, when we start with HDL, 
we first do synthesis that converts our HDL code into a logical design on paper, so to speak. Um, then, then we do the packing and then placement, which takes that paper-based logic design into design composed of FPGA resources. Then we do routing, which is connect the wires between them. And then finally, we're doing the write bitstream step, which takes that design that we have created using FPGA resources and converts them into a binary that can be loaded onto the FPGA. And I think we're done there. So, uh, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll, we'll put down the FPGA in a bit, but let's now write an application that will run on the FPGA, but this will be a software code that will run as a software code on the FPGA on that RISC-V software that we put there. So we're gonna write a simple hello world. Um, and then we're gonna hit compile. We get our hex file out. And then this is a Python script we're running on the host. This again uses our custom JTAG stack to first initialize the connection. Then it you know configures the UART baud rate, it programs the FPGA, it programs and the soft core, and then it pulls the UART port for any messages that are coming in from the device. And there we go. We have our hello world. So let's do something a bit more complex. Now, we, we're going to keep the same SSC hardware, but we're going to change the application completely. And now we're going to interface a temperature sensor. And this is not just reading some data directly from the sensor. We're going to read it. We're going to do some complex computations on it. And then from that, compute the temperature value, which we will then print and send to the um, host. So we're going to go back, run that Python script again after we've compiled our code and takes a little longer to program the software this time because it's a larger application we're putting on there, but there you go. We now have our temperature value. So we did all that and not a single piece of HTL code was seen throughout. So <clears throat> now that we have this, um, sorry about that. Uh, now that we have this um, concept of being able to deploy applications on the FPGA, just by writing software code, can we take this a bit further and now do something even more complex than a temperature sensor? Well, I, I would argue even that that you did a lot of that through configuration. Like there wasn't really the, the fact that there's a UI says a lot, right? Yeah, um, even have something even more abstract than a UI. Like you could just mm -hmm. say, make me a camera sensor design. Right, yeah, we'll or, or pull this. from a catalog of existing existing patterns, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's it's, it's, it's a configuration file. It's a lower footprint to store all that information as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, taking this a bit further, we're going to do something more complex than temperature value, and that's we're going to interface the camera module. So we do need an SPI controller um, that's going to talk to the camera module. But beyond that, everything else we're going to do in software and we don't even have to write the entire software ourselves. We just took the Arduino library for doing this, and we just modified the low-level functions to use our you know, FPGA-specific, our software-specific calls to the SPI and the I2C bus, and that was pretty much it. So we captured a 320 by 240 pixel image using JPEG first. And so this is a software running at 12 megahertz. We got this in one frame a second for JPEG capture. Because we want to do something with an image beyond just capturing and sending it, um, we wanted to get raw pixels out instead. And so we modified it, you know, just a software code, <clears throat> and we got it running at seven seconds for RGB capture. Because it's capturing a lot more data now uh, because the image is no longer compressed, and you can see by the image quality as well. <clears throat> and you get some water after this. So the... So, but we want to do a bit more processing. Uh, and so, you know, while we have the image there on the FPG and we can do something there, um, let's also detect the edge. And so we implemented an edge detection in software. It really slowed things down because now it was doing a lot more processing in software. And so we went from one second JPEG capture to 24 seconds for with the edge detection. I mean, could spend time trying to optimize this, but it's, it's, it's really inefficient at this point. We need to speed things up. And so what we did was, because we have our S5 core on an FPGA, we basically implemented the processing as a systolic array in custom hardware, and we use custom instructions to interface that. 
And so we went from 24 seconds for the edge detection software to 7.5 seconds of edge detection in hardware. And then, you know, we're doing these overlays just for illustrative purposes. What we really need is just the edges. And so a binary image would suffice. And so we could get, get it down to seven seconds, which is almost three and a half times faster. Can we do better though? And absolutely. So <clears throat> we can offload even more stuff to that custom hardware instead of now, instead of previously just doing processing in the custom hardware, which this is totally great, we can offload both the capture and the uh, transmit because as you see here, you know, we can really cut down on transmit time mm -hmm. when we did the binary image, but the capture is still taking a majority of the um, overhead. And so when we modified the design this way, so before when we we're capturing and transmitting in software, it was seven seconds. When we offloaded all three steps, capture process transmit to hardware, we can get it down to 0.3 seconds, which is 23 times faster. And then instead of RGB, when we capture JPEG, which is a lot more compressed, we we'll get it up down to 0.13 seconds, which is 54 times faster. And you see here, you know, transmit is now a bottleneck, and this will keep happening. You can if well, you optimize it's... one piece, <laughs> another piece becomes the bottleneck. I mean, <clears> keep <throat> keep in mind though, that it's it's not that it's I mean, it's a bottleneck, but like it's only it only matters now because you've sped up everything else, right? Exactly. It's not like it changed. The the bottleneck didn't change. It was always the same. Need some exactly. water. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> exactly. And and that's the that's the beauty of having an FPGA there and a soft core. You can make these changes. If this was an ASIC, there's nothing you can do about it. Or if this is a microcontroller, then support anything else uh, beyond the hardware that we had already utilized. I mean, that was it. But because we're in FPGA, we can do things uh, in a lot more complexity. We can try to optimize this even further. Um, but what we can also do is instead of trying to make this more and more efficient, perhaps we can reduce the overall overhead by just not having to send an image at all. Maybe we can process it on the FPG itself. Um, so let's say we wanted to do a person detection. And so what we did was we modified the design slightly. So instead of sending out the image to the host, um, we kept it on the FPG and then we hooked up some more custom instructions that could then fetch that image from the buffer and process it in the soft core. And then we deployed a convolution neural net. We trained it on the host, then we quantized it, and then we deployed it as a pure soft core code on the FPGA. And so again, for illustrative purposes, uh, we're sending out the image still. And as you can see, we're able to detect between a person and not a person. It is slow though. It's, it took about five to six seconds to transmit the next frame. And that was because processing time had gone way up again. Um, now we could again do stuff on the same FPGA chip, trying to improve this, um, but we can also use a different FPGA chip. And we here we you know switch from the CMOD board to the RD board. Again, you, you could do this on the CMOD board because that you can use a PLL to go from 12 to 100 megahertz, which is the oscillator on the RD board. But we just wanted to show that you could move over to a different FPGA board without everything just breaking apart. And we even did some optional SOC changes like add in DDR support versus just having a cache only design. But from the soft core perspective, nothing has changed. It's the same application. And so we went from you know five to six seconds per frame to now I think second, second and a half per frame. And then we can do even more complex operations, we can do something like, let's not do capture process transmit. Let's do capture process. And if we ever detect something, then we do a capture transmit. And we do that for 10 consecutive frames so that we're only sending images when a person is detected and we're able to do them a lot more quickly than we were before. And you could also imagine that another route to take here is to say, well, we don't have to send an image. It's taking a second, second and a half because it's sending the entire image. The transmit overhead is there. What if you're only sending a bit? You know, every half a second, we just send one if it's a person and zero if it's not a person. And that's it. So, um, so that's the wired stuff. So at this point, I think we can say that we are, have our wireless doorbell, uh, our doorbell running. And now Jason's going to talk about how to make this all go wireless.
Okay, thanks, Emmett. So yeah, I'm Jason, and I've been working with Emmett on this project. And um, as was mentioned earlier, we were thinking about applications that might utilize what Emmett has put together in terms of um, FPGAs deployed remotely. And you know, we expected to have hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of these devices deployed. I apologize. I think I am not doing slideshow. My bad. Uh, we can see. Yeah, we can see it now, Jason. Yeah. So sorry Jason, about that. Jason, as you get into this, did you see the link I posted in the chat about NASA actually putting FPGAs on satellites? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. talk about like rem remote management, right? That's pretty remote. And yeah. the 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 impact that might have, like, like, you know, it's not cheap, right? To like update those satellites ever, Absolutely. right? So so if you can remotely update those um, those FPGAs with with something like DISL, then you know you just saved again orders of magnitude of money. <laughs> um, right. So, but uh, there's obviously a challenge with that. So, uh, you know, walk us through that, please. Definitely. So. Yeah, that's you know that that's a vertical we hadn't thought about uh, having things in space. We were thinking of things more uh, on the ground level, where we would expect to have to scale up devices, and anytime devices are scaled up, that has added costs not just for the devices but the maintenance. Um, if one has to go out to um, a field that has poor reception or no reception, or if the design is like a DoD thing that says there absolutely cannot be any direct access to these devices wherever they're deployed. You don't wanna to have to send somebody out with their laptop and a USB cable to update the FPGA or the soft core that takes away the usefulness of having this in place. Um, but another consideration is that as we have more devices, we wanna scale down our resources. So when Emmett was doing the parts that he showed, he was using a Arduino board. And Arduino boards are great for what they do, um, but you don't, you wouldn't necessarily strap a battery to that and strap it to your FPGA and again, put it out in a rural area or in a defense testing site. So we want to cut down on power. And beyond that, you know, our goals, which I believe were mentioned before, was that we wanted to be able to reconfigure the FPGA entirely remotely. And within that, we also wanted to update the soft core. What we expect is that there will be more instances of the soft core needing to be updated by developers than the FPGA. The hope is that the software developers can take these hardware blocks, can get a bitstream in place, and can put it on a device and over time update it. But in terms of like the development workflow, it's expected that the software developers will do this one time, if at all, perhaps somebody else will do it for them, and then they will be updating the soft core remotely. And finally, we needed to have some general means for communicating data from the FPGA device over to you know, a host machine. So the architecture we had in mind was to uh, add on what we're calling comms processor, communications processor. We expect this to have a physical layer uh, connected to the FPGA. This could be USB, it could be UART, it could probably even be CAN. And for the a prototyped PCB that would be put in place, it probably could also just use JTAG and just go directly to programming the FPGA without having um, additional physical layers. Since we wanna be able to do this remotely, the comms processor has to have some kind of radio. That could be Wi-Fi. Uh, it could be LoRa, or it could even be BLE, and or, or microwave. Sure. Yeah. In the case of NASA. Right. Right. Um, so we, as a starting point, went with the Espresso's ESP32 S3 microcontroller, and part of the motivation for that was we are using USB, and the ESP32 S3 does have a USB host controller on board, but. We expect the comms processor to be swappable. We don't want there to be a feeling that one is locked into using an expressive device or you know, we're, we're targeting the Pico W for our next comms processor we put in place. But as Emmett pointed out earlier, we're trying to avoid lock-in as much as possible. The comms processor is meant to be 
sort of like a pass through with you know intelligence that can be added as the application developer uh, chooses. So we set out to think about what we would expect to see for an enterprise architecture for an application that you know would use these uh, remotely reconfigurable FPGA devices. This is not what we actually have put together, spoiler alert, I'll talk about that in the next slide, but we wanted to do our homework and put in place what we would expect things to be like if they were actually put in an enterprise environment. So the devices themselves, we expect to communicate over a message broker, and that could be uh, AMQ, it could be MQTT, uh, it could be Kafka. Scupper. Uh, sorry? Scupper. <laughs> Um, we expect there to be a file server strictly for the devices to access bit streams and hex files for updating the FPGA and the soft core respectively. Uh, in the back end, in a secured network, we expect there to be an application that's maintaining um, a database that would have device information for fleet management. It might have a glacial file server for keeping long-term log files. And then there would be uh, like a general purpose user interface for getting status information and then something for administration of the fleet. And depending on who we have on here, this is a point where we would love anyone in the audience to uh, tell us what we missed or what we could add. Well, there, there, could Jason, wrong. there is a question from the audience that I think is applicable and I think you might have an answer. So uh, Shahan asks, can the FPGA bitstream be reverse engineered or peeked into? Uh, also, have you explored the secure FPGA boot at Red Hat? So our proof of concept doesn't have that in place. Um, I'm not 100% up on uh, adversarial attacks on FPGA bit streams. Uh, Emid, how about you? Are you familiar with that? With the secure boot? No. Uh, but there are quite a few projects out there um, that are looking at reverse engineering FPGA bit stream. There's support for our limited support for the seven series boards and then there's full support for some of the lattice chips and we ha did have a project that was aimed at saying you know once you're able to do that once you're able to have open source tools how do you bridge the gap between those tools and the proprietary stuff so we did have a project that tried to apply uh, operation optimization and reinforcement learning to the problem thanks and sean we're, we'll capture that question um, because like to Jason's, Jason's asking for this kind of feedback. What are the gaps, right? Yeah. And we, we want to be able to answer that directly, even if the answer is we haven't done anything there yet. Uh, and that's something that the community might help build. Yeah, greatly appreciate that question. Um, so moving forward into what we currently have, uh, all of the, all of what we have right now is running on a PC sitting on my desk. And so we have a Postgres database for keeping device information. And we use the Mosquito MQTT broker, uh, partly because it's open source and partly because we've seen wide use with it. But again, we're not locked into it. We have a simple Apache file server for serving up the bitstreams and the hex files. And uh, while we didn't put together two separate UIs for admin and status, we put together kind of like a hybrid control UI just to start interacting with the devices. And then for checking out what was happening on the message broker side of things, we use an existing tool called MQTT Explorer for just verifying what information is being sent around from the broker to our devices. Um, for time constraints, I will just quickly say that I won't go deep into MQTT, but basically, like a lot of brokers, it's um, it's built around having topics. And so here we have the topics for communication that we have in place. We have an uptime message one that we used for debugging. Uh, we have a way of sending commands to the device and another topic for getting responses. And then, as I had mentioned earlier, we have a means for the FPGA to send generalized data across to the ESP32 in this case, which by this formatting, it sends out the topic that it wants data written to, and then it sends the message that it wants written to that topic. And the comms processor just formats that into the UUID for uh, the specific device name and whatever topic name was provided. 
So this is the UI we put together for controlling. And I don't know if my mouse can be seen there. I know others. Yeah, we can see them. your mouse. OK, I will move my mouse afterwards, but this will help me know what I'm talking about. So we can enter the MQTT broker up here as port connect. We have a drop down over here that queries the Postgres database and gets our device information, uh, gets the UUIDs of them. And then we have a status section that'll give us info on what firmware version is running, um, on the comms processor, on the soft core, what bitstream or, or hex file was most recently updated to the FPGA or soft core, and um, both doorbell and temperature detection. Um, we have as I'll show when I get to the, the actual demo board part, we have a file system attached to the comms processor because we have to have some way for to get the files from the file server over to update the FPGA. And so this gives a listing what files are available. And then finally down here, uh, we're able to reconfigure the FPGA, giving it a file name from over here. And same deal, we can reprogram the soft core, giving it a file name. Jason, there's a question from the audience here uh, from Edder. Would it be possible to use FPGA partial reconfiguration and have the COM processor inside the FPGA? So, would that, are, are you, are you, do you mean like running a soft core inside the FPGA? Yeah, it, it's absolutely possible. There's, a, there's an IP called ICAP that Xilinx provides um, that allows you to, you know, program, re or, partially reconfigure part of the fabric from another part of the fabric. And that could be, you know, custom pipeline or it could be a soft core. Um, we haven't explored that as part of this, but the capability is absolutely there. All right. Thanks, Evan. Thank you. So quickly going through the demo board, it's really similar to what Emmett showed, only I'm showing my demo board because in the videos, um, this is the one that will be seen. So um, we have the Arja cam at the top. We have, I use the CMOD A7, which is the slower oscillating, well, has the slower oscillator in terms of the two FPGA boards. And here's the ESP32 S3 for the comms. And over here is a micro SD card breakout board that provides a file system. And then for debugging purposes, we have an OLED here that gives out information about the uptime from that heartbeat message I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, in the interest of time, what I would like to do is um, jump ahead to the demo that actually shows the camera because that's yeah, probably thanks, more Jason. interesting. Yeah, just, thanks, Jason. Just the warning, you're, we're down to right. you know, less than 15 minutes. Yeah. So, but just for folks that are interested, these demos are available on uh, a video that was attached to the Red Hat Research website where we walk through these as well. So one of them just showed the FPGA bitstream being updated remotely. And then this one showed using the temperature sensor, which involved updating the soft core. But the really fun one is with the camera. So if I can, there we go. So we use the same FPGA bitstream that Emmett showed earlier um, so that we can connect with the Argicam over serial peripheral interface and I squared C bus. Um, what we added was the ability for the comms processor to receive information about whether there was a detection or not. And then this gets transmitted out over a doorbell topic, either detected or not detected. And then that will show up in the status section of the GUI that I showed earlier. So let this get started. And so I'll get rid of my mouse so I don't make things even more confusing to mice running around. So I'm putting in my MQTT broker name. I selected the device. The device status, device files, all populated by querying information. I am reconfiguring for the camera bitstream. And so in the device status, it's now telling me that it's updating to that bitstream. That will only set up the hardware. And what we'll see once it finishes reconfiguring is uh, a bright LED will come on the CMOD board. And that's happening. That just happened in the video. And now the FPGA file status has been updated to indicate that it's complete. So now I'm going to update the soft core with the camera hex file. This one's really quick. It just updates and now 
it has the uh, camera soft core, it will get version information once it gets a message. So now that indicates that we're on the camera version. And it's detected me already because in this video, I'm standing right in front of it. So, and also you'll see the temperature is a question mark because we're not using the temperature on here. So I'm putting my hand over it so that it can no longer see me. And again, this is using the slower oscillator. So it takes at least five seconds to detect. So it's showing no detection. Now I take my hand away. I'm still standing there. And it takes, like I said, it takes at least five seconds, but it can take um, up to 10 seconds to detect because I'm using the slower oscillating board, but it does detect me. And you can see that the status changed there. So in terms of what we've shown so today and what we consider innovative a part, a part of it, um, Dissel makes some interesting things possible. It really puts together a separation of hardware and software so that uh, synergistic co-design can take place with FPGAs. It lets a software developer focus on application development without having to go into hardware description language, without having to really get into the guts of the low level accelerators. It does require somebody with hardware knowledge to put together the IP blocks. Somebody had asked that earlier in the chat. There is a hardware developer in this workflow, but the differentiator is that the hardware and software developers, you know, can communicate and should communicate and they will have like integration sessions, but the software developer doesn't have to put pragmas in place to try to adhere to you know, what Xilinx wants or what Intel and Altera want. They're just writing C code, like Emmett showed earlier. Yeah, but also the the benefit of having a catalog. Exactly. Could, you know, like the hardware developer is a one-to-many relationship, right? right? They can service a whole lot of developers because they're just repeating the same patterns every time. Yeah. So the, um, and we did show you know, the demo of Emmett's work for the very simplified system generation and how a software developer can just go in, select those IP blocks and have a bitstream created without having to, again, dig into the guts. Beyond that, we showed that we were able to manage devices with wireless access in the field. And we intend on adding onto that with further comms processors and, um, putting together more sophisticated security for the proof of concept. We showed our UIs for both the system generation, the programming and device access and management. And as was mentioned in the chat earlier, our demonstration code is available and we encourage folks to contact us if they would like access and would like to uh, collaborate or provide other types of input. And so Emmett and I can be reached at these email addresses and um, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that uh, beyond this Red Hat Research Day event, we have other ones and we encourage folks to check them out and to check out our quarterly publication. Awesome. Hey, thank you guys. This is amazing presentation. And uh, I think I'm, I'm even, you know, you've heard me like pontificate on other use cases plenty of times, but I have like four more now that I kind of cooked up while we were, while we were talking uh, that I'm, going to definitely take back to the field for, for consideration. Um, uh, so we have about seven minutes left in our time today. So uh, please, from the audience, any additional Q&A, now's the time. Uh, you know, throw your questions into the, into the chat. I'll, I'll read them out for, for everybody to, to respond to. Um, or if you just want to like heap praise on these two uh, brilliant people, that's also very welcome. Uh, though they're, it's probably just going to make them uncomfortable. But, but I encourage you doing that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the, other, the other use case that I, well, just one more, is um, uh, this is something that came up with the USG, uh, USGS. So they're responsible for all the waterways in the United States. And uh, they have sensors that are distributed uh, in you know, streams, rivers, lakes, et cetera. And those sensors are designed to uh, detect changes in 
uh, water chemistry. So like salinity or anything of that nature. And the, the use case is to guard against disasters. So um, imagine a mine in West Virginia has just uh, its storage of um, uh, corrosive chemicals has just spilled into the waterway next to it. Right. These are the sensors that detect that change and those new chemicals. But we need to react really quickly. We, we need a series of, of decisions to be made rapidly. This is the kind of system that can actually do that uh, right there to actually you know, close a spillway. Um, and making sense of that data coming off these sensors in real time is really important. And th these are all like, you know, very small uh devices that are engaged on the, the waterways themselves um so <laughs> i'm not picking on west virginia it's just they had an actual this is a real thing that happened in west virginia very recently um and actually a couple times now uh so yeah being able to to close that spillway immediately uh is has direct impact on the people who live downstream from that right uh and um you know, this is how we're able to innovate and uh, and develop new new uh, la layers of cognition. And I every I keep saying cognition, and the reason I say that is because like, I don't want to say AI, because like it's too it's too much of a hot topic. It's like the it's really you know any number of any type of logic really, whether it's something that's um, you know a machine learning model, a, a generative AI, whatever. Uh, or just rules or any sort of heuristics, um, this is a wonderful place for that innovation to happen uh, because of the the footprint, because of the cost. Um, so anyways, I encourage everyone to, th to think a little bit more broadly about how we might uh, leverage this approach for our customers, for, um, or your customers, I should say, for um, just in general and, the the call to action here, everyone, is to become involved in this act, in this activity. Join this group. Start to um, provide your ideas, uh, even if you're not putting hands to keyboard. Uh, your feedback is very welcome because it will help evolve this capability. Uh, Heidi, I think that's it for today. I don't see any. I haven't seen any questions pour in. So, uh, besides, you know. Uh, a clear, a clear uh, division between wh which Virginia is the best, uh, which I will not address. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to get into that for sure. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, Ben, for hosting this conversation. Um, it's been great to hear all the comments back and, um, and to also hear from 3EO. So we really appreciate that back and forth. If anybody thinks of ideas afterwards or communities we should reach out to or, um, you know, other places that would like to hear more about the details of how to program the hardware dynamically this way, please um, do drop us an email or use any of the other contacts from the slides. We'll send out the slides uh, and a link to the videos after the event. So look in your email if you want to follow up on that. Thanks very much and see you at the next research event. Thank you. Bye-bye.